from kinetics is a major science, uh, scientific uh, subject from circle science, I should say. Uh, and it is with, as you probably know, the absorption, distribution, and elimination of drugs. <coughs> However, there's another side to it. When we give drugs, we do that in order to elicit some effect. And <coughs> what happens in between those two events is my speciality area. So I thrive in the middle to understand <coughs> what exposure we get to a drug after an administration. What's the time course of that exposure? And how does that exposure then translate <coughs> into eliciting a pharmacological effect? Which in this case is an ECG, but uh, with the subject matter in hand, it might be something else. Um, I'm to speak about DMT kinetics, and as far as I know, this is the only publication which has addressed DMT kinetics. It was published um, two years ago, but it's in fact based on data uh, Rick Strassman obtained um, in 1991. Um, <coughs> this is, in some respects, a um, uh, heroic effort on their uh, on their part, but from my perspective, um, it's not very satisfactory. So I had the opportunity to discuss this with Rick Strassman last May, and he graciously uh, consented to, well actually offered to share his original data with me. So what we go back to do now is to look at the original data that this study was based upon. Uh, the study search <laughs> involved 10 subjects, and they received four different doses, well, most of them did, um, in a randomized sequence. Uh, samples were obtained up to one hour after dose, and their method of analysis was uh, gas chromatography <laughs> and mass spectrometry. And whenever you start to get results that we got then this summer from Rick Strassman, it's always good to get to see what they look like, what you have to work with. And this is just a selection of two of the subjects, uh, looking at the data from the four different doses. Um, <coughs> and as you see, it's a bit scattered. Sometimes it's only three observations, sometimes it's more. Um, so how do you work with this? Um, if we look at all the subjects and all the doses, what I've done in the next slide is to uh, divide the concentrations with the given dose. And on the y-axis you have the dose normalized concentrations, and on the x-axis you have time after dose, and the axis have the same scales. <coughs> um, so this illustrates two things, one of them being that there's quite a deal of inter-individual variability in exposure, um, some having quite low exposure, other having quite much higher exposure. And the second thing is that in reality, all these four curves should be, should be superimposed in each individual. And in many cases, they're not, which um, could indicate either there's a dose dependency or there's an uh, occasion dependency. That is, that there's also an intra-individual variability. So how do we approach to analyze this type of data? Well, <laughs> one approach is to look at each individual one by one and analyze the, um, and determine the pharmacokinetic parameters in each individual, and then sort of uh, come to overall mean and overall standard deviation of um, those results. That would be the standard approach. <coughs> Um, I would prefer an alternative approach, and that is to pool all the data. So this is all the data <coughs> to the left on a linear concentration axis versus time, um, and then to the right you just have with the log scale for the concentration axis. Um, normally, well, normally really, but <coughs> this seems to indicate that there is a tailing in the data. Um, suggesting that there might be a later, somewhat slower elimination phase. 
So how to analyze then this type of pool data? Well, <coughs> you can apply a pharmacokinetic model to describe the average individual. So you have a model describing the typical, well, um, the typical person, whereby you get the typical parameter values, such as clearance and the volume of distribution. Clearance being the term describing the elimination capacity and volume of distribution describing the apparent volume into which the compound is distributed in the body. But doing it this way, you just sort of get the mean. And what's also interesting is then the um, variability between individuals. So you can also apply this to look at what happens to um, subject I and also calculate the uh, parameters for the subject. And what you then have then is the parameter value um, based on the typical value, but then also with a uh, difference or a residual, which then describes the variability, both explained variability and unexplained error. So this could be the most simple pharmacokinetic um, model uh, you can imagine, with an input, in this case in form of an intravenous dose, then elimination <coughs> from just one single compartment. But considering that we saw this tailing in the data earlier, we choose to apply a um, two-compartment model, which also includes redistribution from the central compartment to a peripheral one, and then back distribution in the end. So this is now our tentative model using uh, the Strassman data. All in all, we have 165 observations. We have applied a two-compartment disposition model. Uh, we have tried the more simple one and the more, more complex ones, but we're sort of working with this at the moment. We have applied um, first order, that means non-satable elimination. And we have also applied the possibility then that clearance values and the volume of the central compartment can vary between individuals. And the software we uh, are using is pretty standard. It's called non-mem. And these are basically the results. I will try, try to uh, explain these. These are so-called goodness of fit plots whereby the, oops, wrong button, <coughs> whereby the <laughs> observed data is plotted against the population predictions, that is the typical predi value predictions. And what you want to see there is really uh, sort of a straight line, which I've indicated in the red one here. Um, deviations from a straight line here might mean that we um, have something wrong with, with a structural model. And we will be working on this because we are far from finished yet. The plot to the right is also the observed observations, that, that is the concentration data, plotted now against the individual predictions from each individual. And again, you, sh uh, you would expect the data to converge on a straight line, and actually that looks pretty decent. The two bottom ones are also standard goodness of fit plots, but these are related to the residuals, and basically they should be horizontal lines. <coughs> now, you can fit the model, but you also need to know, apart from such goodness of fit plots, um, how good the model works. And one way of doing that, is to use what we call a visual predictive check. Again, you have the observations here, and then <laughs> you have the um, fifth, 50th, and 95th percentile. Now, what we're doing here is that we take the model parameter values and we simulate the data set, let's say, 1,000 times to see whether we can recreate the data, uh, that is, that the model can predict um, the data that we had from the beginning. And <coughs> we do that 
by seeing that we have these 95 uh, percent confidence intervals around the percentiles and ideally then the red lines should be within this sector, this sector and that sector. And we're doing fine apart from the top ones here but again we are <coughs> still very much into early stages. In fact we've only been doing this for one month so we really haven't had a lot of time with this. Uh, but it looks to be on its way. And of course, you also get the parameter estimates and the residual squared error. Now, these values should be prefer preferably below 30%. And these look very nicely. So we have a measurement here of the clearance for the elimination capacity, which is 13 liters per minute. And then also for the volumes, if you so wish. But this is the most important parameter because clearance is the parameter which will determine the degree of, expo of exposure in an individual. What we have to the right, since we had the possibility to have uh, variability, variability between individuals, we have the inter-individual variability. And you s as you see for clearance, that's more than 100%, which is pretty high. So this indicates that DMT does have a um, quite a substantial uh, inter-individual variability in how different people are able to eliminate the compound. Um, as a form of kinetics, I was very surprised to see this number because anything above 1.5 liters per minute is very unusual. And why I say 1.5 liters per minute is that that's the average blood flow through the liver and that would be the highest possible clearance for a compound which is metabolized only in the liver. But I realized that since DMT is metabolized by <coughs> monoamino oxidases, which are all over the body, it's not just limited to the liver, it's quite feasible to have a, such an uh, unusual value for a clearance for a compound. Now, we wanted to do some work on our own as well. Um, I can just say that as a sort of aside that uh, compared with the original um, values reported in that paper I showed you, these are about 100 fold different. So there is a difference in how data analysis has been performed. Um, we wanted to be, to be able to do our own stuff as well, so we spent one year more or less um, developing a, our own method for the uh, analysis of DMT in human plasma. What you need is a, a sensitive and selective detector. You need to be able to separate compound from other compounds. You do that on the separation column. You need a pump to pump through the separation column eluting the compound to the detector, and you need to be able to inject the compound from a sample after having performed a sample cleanup. Uh, so this is what our information looks like with the pumps here, the injector there, there's a column there in between, and the uh, detector to the right. So this type of detection actually breaks up the molecule and what you are looking at are specific fragments of the molecule. And this is one of the reasons why this way of detection is not only very um, selective, sorry, sensitive, but also very selective. When developing a, a method, which I say is nothing that you just sort of pick out a method from the cupboard, but you have to work pretty hard to um, uh, sort of create one, um, you need to uh, find a suitable column, for instance. You need to optimize how to retain and elute your compound from that column. Uh, you need to uh, optimize um, and tweak your um, uh, detector in terms of collision energy and so on. So this is just an um, illustration of the um, fragments that we have been looking at 
for DMT to the left and for the internal standard to the right. Then we also need to consider how to um, handle the samples as such and then how to uh, validate the assay. I won't go through all of this, but we need to have a suitable internal standard. Uh, we need to s somehow clean up the plasma samples so we can inject it on the column. And then we need to, to have the checks that the assay is actually performing reliably. So our selected uh, internal standard is this one here. As you see, it's strictly very late related to DMT but with an extra carbon. And um, <laughs> it's good to have an eternal standard which is as physically, chemically, as similar as possible to the uh, compound that you want to analyze. So our sample workup at the moment is very uh, simple. We just take 200 microliters of plasma. We add some acetonitrile containing the internal standard. We mix it and centrifuge it, and then inject five <coughs> microliters of the supernatant on the chromatographic system. Uh, this is just to show the um, sort of standard curve that we get. Um, so we have a standard curve with <laughs> eight calibration samples ranging from two to 800 nanomolar. And it's also good to know that each time we're running an assay, apart from the calibration curve, which is new and fresh on, on all locations. We also run six quality control samples, two at low, mid, and high levels. And we use these as a control that the RC is actually reliably working on that particular day. Our lower limit of quantitation is roughly two nanomolar, which is about half of what I deduced to be the one used in the Gallimore um, Strassman paper. So these are some results just from the control, uh, quality control samples. These are the results obtained from using the calibration curve for the uh, low quality control samples, which normally are 6 nanomolar, then 240 nanomolar in the mid, then 600 nanomolar to the right, <coughs> to the high ones. And as you see, on average, we're doing pretty well. And looking at the precision and the accuracy, precision should be below 15%. So we're doing fine there. And accuracy should, of course, be 100%. We're doing pretty well there as well. So what we can say then that we have been able to develop an asset which seems to be sensitive enough and reproducible enough for clinical studies. So we did this because we had this ongoing collaboration with um, Chris Timmerman and Robin Carhart Harris, um, who were conducting a study um, combining then some kinetics with um, neuro imaging in terms of EEG recordings. So it's still a small study, but um, Certain individuals receiving three different doses. Um, we actually designed the study to take the samples at different time points because when you're using the chosen mixed modeling approach when analyzing the data, it's much easier to pool data and actually obtain more information but by not having regular time points for all individuals. And we applied our uh, um, LCMS MS method <laughs> Uh, I won't show you all the data. This is data from the mid-size um, uh, dose. And it's not perfect, but it looks okay. Um, we haven't done the uh, final analysis of this yet because we're still awaiting some additional data from London. Uh, but having a quick look at this, uh, we get a clearance value of 18, which is very similar to the results from the Strassman data, which was 1314. Uh, again, a very short half-life, less than 10 minutes. Um, and a surprisingly high volume of distribution as well. 
Now, that's just <laughs> the beginning, so to speak, because um, what you've seen are what are <laughs> appears to be the only PK or pharmacokinetic results or data on DMT so far published, but kinetics as such is just kinetics, so to speak. And kinetics only becomes really interesting when related to effects. So from the same study, uh, these are some um, EEG data. Uh, when the subjects receive placebo, uh, this is just the auxiliary pattern. And the black solid line here is the sensory um, results, that is the um, degree of, of experience, so to speak. And as you see, the EEG pattern is different when DMT is administered, and also it follows in time-wise with the sensory data. Taking it a, it a step further, looking at the different ways, again, you have the sensory curve here, and then you have uh, a decrease in the beta waves, a decrease in the alpha waves, and this is, to me, quite brilliant because, uh, to me, this gives an opportunity to seek to model not only the, the kinetics, but also the dynamics and link those two, to, two together. Um, and for a person with my interest, this type of data is a dream because it's rich, it is um, crisp, it's highly resolved. And that would make the PK slash PD modeling very interesting indeed. Um, so we will get some way to be able to understand how closely linked is the exposure and the time course of the exposure with the degree of effects and the time course of the effect. Now these, of course, are the immediate effects. Um, and then we have my coming two slides, I realize are the two slides um, which probably have been shown the most during this meeting. But there was results like this which really flabbergasted me and really got me hooked. <laughs> because to me this is um, really counterintuitive to everything I've learned before. This total disconnect in time between a very brief exposure to a compound lasting just a few hours with an effect lasting months. Um, you see this also in the uh, imperial study, this very long lasting effect. But you also see that there's quite a degree of variability between the different subjects. Um, we don't know what the driving force is for this really prolonged effect, um, but it would be very, very exciting to me anyhow to see what can be done to investigate all these steps and all the relationships and processes from giving the dose to having exposure to getting an experience and to get a prolonged effect like this. And I think actually this can also be um, carried out by <laughs> modeling. One approach would be to use what is called time to event analysis, see how long time it takes for a uh, say depression score to return to a critical level. Um, or with considering the type of data at hand, it would be even more, I think, interesting to use a sort of a effect model uh, and I think in this case one can use what is called indirect response models. Because then we'll, we'll be able to get a more complete overall picture of everything that is happening. And also understand uh, reasons or causes of uh, individual variability in, um, in these effects. Um, yeah. So another reason why to obtain um, pharmacokinetic parameter values is that you can use them to simulate things. And this is just an illustration of this. Uh, this is an attempt to simulate 
uh, an infusion rate regimen by which one would be able to achieve steady state levels of DMT in such a short time of duration as possible, or in short experimental time as possible. Um, <coughs> and of course, one idea behind giving a constant rate infusion or giving it by infusion is that you could emulate the um, situation of the AOS gap and with its pr uh, more pr uh, prolonged experience um, and also uh, I think by using several different steps here or um, steady state levels this could be very um, interesting from a neuroimaging point of view and even to toy with the idea a little bit further, um, would it be possible, for instance, to have some sort of self-control demonstration? That if we're at this level and ready to go to the next, you press the green button. If you want to go from there to there, you press the green button again. But if you decide that, you know, enough for me, you press the red button. And of course, the concentrations will decline uh, as quickly as they would have after an intravenous bolus dose, that is, with a half-life of eight to ten minutes or so. So, to end, um, I know you might be interested when you <coughs> pass your customs border tomorrow when returning home, if you do to know how much you're packing. It's possible to calculate the amount of DMT you have in your body. Um, and the amount in the body is actually the plasma concentration times the volume of distribution. And if we take the plasma concentrations to be somewhere around our lower limit of quantitation, which is two nanomolar, of course, in blank samples, we don't see any DMT. So it has to be below that. Um, you're probably carrying about half a milligram. And when I calculated this number, uh, I was generally surprised because I thought this is very low. But that's what I calculate. Um, <coughs> last week I got <coughs> information that um, uh, Sogrinsk Academy uh, has decided to sponsor a PhD in my group to work in particular with um, uh, uh, PKDM of psychedelia, um, which is happy news for me. Um, it means that uh, we will have somebody who will be able to continue acid uh, development and validation. We would like to include the DMT metabolites we are considering metoxid DMT. Um, we might also consider other compounds depending on upcoming collaborations to which we are very open to. And above all, we would like to develop um, our ideas for more modeling and simulation in this area. Um, so to wrap it up, um, I'd like to thank and give acknowledgement to Adam Bendrua, who's here, and also Kurt Jürgen Hoffmann, who both put a lot of work into developing the assay. To Sandra Granana, who's also here, who has spent one very intense month doing the modeling of the Strassman data. Um, and there's still more to do there because we have other things to include, like gender and age and dose size and things like that. So. We will struggle on. And naturally, also um, Rick Strassman oops, and uh, Chris Timmerman and Robin Carhart Harris for um, sharing the data. Uh, I would also like to thank um, Philip Ashton for uh, bringing me, <laughs> making me interested in this, um, in this psychedelic research area and also for his encouragement for. Uh, take my first steps in this direction. So, uh, this has been 
rather a different subject. Um, but um, whereas I think before we had no reliable data or results at all on DMT, I think we now are getting there. And I see ahead of us a great potential in using PKP the modeling in understanding the processes which are taking place and about which we might be not so clever in using frequentist analysis, but I think modeling and simulation will provide a more interesting approach. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much to Michael Askton for this interesting lecture. Any questions on uh, human pharmacokinetics? We have Benjamin here. Hi, thanks very much. The last slide that you gave was talking about the plasma concentrations DMT. Are you saying that DMT is, in fact, endogenously produced? Yes. Well, that's a... I, mean, I agree with you personally, but there's some people that don't, and I'm wondering uh, how and where do you think it's produced? Oh, um, I'm very new to this area, so I wouldn't be able to give you a very good answer on that. Some people have suggest the pituitary gland, um, but you should not take my word for it. Um, I think one of the aspects of this surprisingly, well, to me surprisingly um, low amount of DMT in the body is that if there is an association between uh, near-death experiences and DMT, at least from that calculation um, point of view, there's very little DMT in the body to do that. Yes. Yeah, well, the, it had been suggested in the, in the pineal gland, but actually the enzymes that, so for example, in rabbits, they have been found in the pineal gland, the enzymes that yeah. should metabolize, uh, for example, tryptamine into, into DMT, but not in humans. Actually, Rick Strassman tried to, to get a pineal gland from 10, 10 corpses, mm -hmm. and he, he couldn't find any DMT, but they were, of course, they were not frozen, and properly preserved. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very difficult problem, I guess. So, um, and about the, the near-death experiences, yeah, that, that, uh, there is, a, well, I don't know if David Nichols is in the audience, but I think he, he wrote a paper about the, precisely saying that the concentrations could not be enough in principle to really reach the trust level. Mm -hmm. My question is more about, like, uh, it's, DMT is, it has this special status because it seems to be it seems not to produce tolerance, you know, tolerance uh, as opposed to many other psychedelics, serotonin psychedelics. So Rick Strassman did this studies which he gave repeated AV injections, and the effect apparently there was no no tolerance. So my question is, how, how could that be? I mean, how could it be that that the, the certain receptors are not being done regulated by DMT agonism? Or maybe if that could be the case that they are in fact, but they are s at so 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 at the time scale is so slow compared to other psychedelics, so that basically this this model, especially the model that has been put forward in the art article by Gallimore and Strassman, could completely collapse if even that s small don't regulation is not taken into account. So what do you think about this problem of of tolerance and and? and um. Again, I don't think I would be able to give you a good um, answer on that, but I could suggest something, that if you do have um, acute tolerance, uh, one could imagine doing a study with uh, low-level concentrate infusions and then see what happens over time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that has been developed. Not to my knowledge, no. Hi. Mm. I was just wondering, do we know if DMT is binds to any plasma proteins? That's on our list. Do um, you think that it's possible to be a link between um, uh, people that are in autistic and schizophrenic to the quantity that uh, have a DMT uh, endogenous uh, and that these people, when t uh, usually take DMT, have uh, a small amount of time. That um, I mean, what what I 
Uh, I, I give uh, to different uh, people that are autistic and schizophrenic, and I see a correlation that, uh, for example, schizophrenic people have only three minutes trip of uh, smoking, and autistic is like five, six minutes. And, and I, I was reading papers about um, that says that there is correlation between uh, the, the DMT that is in, in the urine um, uh, when, when are in these spectrums. And I want to ask you what, what opinion do you have? Do you think it's possible or do you think it's, uh, that uh, the brain or the body resolve this in a different way? Sorry, don't know. Okay. I won't pretend to. <laughs> There have been suggestions of um, actual transport of the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and even though the CSF is not really a very good liquid either, um, it might be better. But um, definitely another item on our list would be to look at the possibility of actual transport. Another um, answer to your question could be that uh, there is known variability in some people who have a lot more monoamine oxidase mm -hmm than others. And so if they've got a baseline high levels of monoamine oxidase from, you know, possibly from just being really stressed out, then, um, then as a result of that, they're going to metabolize the DMT really quickly. And certainly that's seen in people going to ayahuasca ceremonies. There are some people that come really stressed out because they've been drinking too much coffee or they've been going to the gym and pumping up their adrenal glands. And so they have high levels of monoamine oxidase when they start the ceremony and basically they drink loads of ayahuasca and don't have any DMT experience or very little. And so that could be one explanation as to uh, why your people are having less DMT. We have time for a few more questions if anybody has any more on the heart. All right, then... Um, I once again would like to invite everybody to uh, join tonight's uh, after party at Norden. We will be, um, be hosting a get together there. You can get tickets online at a link and the discount code, because it is now free, so everybody and as many as possible can join, is Afterglow. So please do join. Um, let's give another big hand to uh, Michael Ashton for his work.